That's the opening line of The Prowler, a 1951 film noir about an L.A. cop who falls for a married woman after responding to a call at her home. It's not just a classy thriller, it's a thriller about class. Oh, thank you so much for coming. You reported a prowler, ma'am? Yes, about 20 minutes ago. I looked up and there was this man looking in the window. Which window? It was one of the back windows. Oh, there's an empty lot on that side, isn't it? Yes. When he saw that I'd seen him, he jumped away from the window and I, I phoned you. We better check that lot for footprints, Webb. Roger. Directed by the soon-to-be blacklisted filmmaker Joseph Losey, and written by two more blacklist victims, Hugo Butler and Dalton Trumbo, The Prowler has all the standard, by now cliched building blocks of film noir. Doomed love, furtive criminal plotting, desperation, greed, murder. But the film's power comes from its recognition that all these elements are fed by a deeper, darker force, class resentment. The Prowler opens a window into the heart of film noir and clarifies that every sin committed by characters in noir comes from the same source, envy. And afterwards, just as I was putting my robe on, I looked up and there he was. Well, if I was you from now on, I'd keep the curtain closed. You ever notice in a bank they always keep the counting room out of sight so the customers won't get tempted? I suppose you're right. I just didn't think. Oh, it's you. No footprints out here. The grass has just been cut and it'd be kind of hard to spot. And again, maybe the lady's just imagining things. He was just as plain as your friend's face just now. All noir is about brute appetite, about wanting what you don't have and taking moral shortcuts to get it. The French critics who named this sort of movie and praised its artistry and courage at a time when most American critics treated it as sleazy pop trash weren't just responding to the genre's photographic daring, smoky atmosphere, and existential weariness. They were also applauding the genre's potential for social criticism, for tearing away society's grinning false face and revealing the monster beneath. The basic appeal of noir was always prurient the chance to watch sexy, impulsive people break some or all of the Ten Commandments. But running just beneath this spectacle of bad behavior was a river of discontent, a sense that the so-called good life taking shape in post-war America wasn't really that good, that it was, in fact, quite toxic because it was based on envy, on greed and materialism, on the desire to get ahead no matter what. I suppose you're married. Most of the good-looking girls I run into are. Is this questionnaire in the line of duty? <laughs> Could be. I am married. Happily married. I was happily married to a girl like you. I wouldn't leave you alone nights. There's nothing wrong with being a policeman. Nothing wrong with digging ditches either, delivering the mail. I'd rather be one of those guys who shows up around 10 in the morning after having a big argument with himself over whether he'll drive the station wagon today or the convertible. Why did you marry him, Susan? Because I loved him. Try again. Why did you marry me? While I was knocking around at movie studio gates, I, I found out a few things about myself. I, I married him because I wanted a family. That's why we got this big house. I wanted kids. So have you got them? No. What other reason was there? To stay away from men like you. But it didn't do any good, did it? You're a real cop, aren't you? You want everything free. Oh, you're wrong. People never give anything to cops for free. They always figure to get something out of it. I think you'd better get out of here. Why oh, wouldn't I be a fool to do a thing like that? I'll report you. Go ahead. You know where the phone is. Please go. Please leave me alone. Stop it. What do you think I am? I told you to leave me alone. Please don't. I mean it, Cliff. Please don't. Fall in love. 
aside from his blue uniform and badge. The character of Webb is a prototypical noir hero, a failed high school basketball star quietly seething over what he doesn't have. Webb's forbidden love, Susan Gilvray, a beloved local radio host's much younger wife, subtly played by Evelyn Keyes, is likewise dissatisfied. I know how you feel, always sneaking around, never really feeling free. He loves me. He's been so sweet to me, and I betrayed him. I lied to him. I felt so rotten. I wish I'd never seen you. I can't see you anymore. Did you hide that gun? I tried to, but it was gone. What a crazy fool. If he'd do it, I know he would. One of the most distinctive things about The Prowler is the somewhat confounding tone of its lead characterizations. Webb and Susan aren't your typical noir couple, a ruthless femme fatale and her hard-boiled sap of a lover. There's a place I want you to see. It's, it's a sort of a thing that I've dreamed of owning someday, a motor court. Every time I hit Las Vegas, I take a good look at it just to make sure it's still there. You and I had something like that in each other. Our troubles be over. We wouldn't have to worry about anything as long as we live. I don't know. Webb presents as a genuinely decent guy, a knight in shining armor, and Losey shoots Van Heflin the way Clint Eastwood films himself, making the most of the actor's sturdy physique, granite face, and imposing height. Officer Garwood, would you please stand up and face the witness? And although Susan maintains sympathy right up to the end, her appearance of normalcy seems almost as hinky as Webb's. Although her well-heeled demeanor suggests a pacified post-war suburban housewife, some secret part of her is drawn to Webb. It's not just that they grew up in the same hometown. They share a suppressed but gnawing conviction that what they've got isn't sufficient. At times, the burly cop's increasingly vicious actions seem to fulfill Susan's secret wishes. Losey and his screenwriters were all left-leaning social critics, men who either were vilified or were about to be vilified by guardians of the status quo. The Prowler's happy-faced suburban approach to film noir takes noir's potential for social criticism out of the shadows and places it center frame where you can get a good look at it. Susan, suppose I hadn't known you, not at all. Suppose I was just the cop on the beat. It happened anyway, be just the same now as far as he's concerned. Only you'd be alone, and so would I. These characters aren't thrillingly dark fantasy figures upon whom the audience can project its dirty daydreams. They're uncomfortably close to quote-unquote normal. Their moral relativism hits close to the bone, because it's easy to see them as people we might know. Perhaps, in the worst of all possible worlds, people we might recognize by looking in a mirror. It's an ambulance. What are we going to do?